today we are going to talk about reinforcement learning and how you can apply to many different problems. Uh, so hopefully by the end of the talk, you will know how to use reinforcement learning for your problem, for your applications, what are the things we can do in at Google with all this new technology. So let me go a little bit. Do you remember when you tried to do something difficult that was hard, that you need to try a lot? For example, when you learn how to walk, do you remember? I don't remember, but it's pretty hard, because nobody tells you exactly how to do it. You just keep trying. And eventually, you are able to stand up, keep the balance, wobble around, and start walking. So what if we want to teach this little cute little robot how to walk? Imagine how will you do that? How we tell this robot how to walk? So what we are going to do today is learn how we can do that with machine learning. And the reason for that is because if we want to do this by coding, like a set of rules, it will be really hard. What kind of rules would we put in code that can actually make this robot work? You have to do coordination, balance. It's really difficult. And then the robot would just fall over, you know, we, and we don't know what to change in the code. Instead of that, we're going to use machine learning to learn from it. So the agenda for today is going to be this. We're going to cover very quickly what is like supervised learning, reinforcement learning, what is TF agents, this thing we just talked about it. And we will go through multiple examples. So you can see we can build up different pieces to actually go and solve this problem and teach this robot how to work. And finally, we will have some take home methods that you can take with you all today. So how many of you know what is supervised learning? OK, that's pretty good. For those of you who doesn't know, let's go a very simple example. So we're going to have some inputs, in this case, like an image. And we're going to pass through our model. And we're going to predict some output. In this case, it's going to be a cat or a dog. And then we're going to tell you what is the right answer. So that's the key aspect. In supervised learner, we tell you the label. What is the right answer? So you can modify your model and learn from these mistakes. In this case, imagine it's a neural net where you have a lot of weights that you can learn. And you can modify those connections to basically learn over time what is the right answer. The thing that supervised learning needs is a lot of labels. So many of you probably heard about ImageNet. It's a data set collected by Stanford. It took like over two years and a million dollars to gather all this data. And they annotate millions of images with labels. Say, in this image, there's a container ship, there's a motor scooter, there's a leopard. And then you label all these images so your model can learn from it. And that works really well, where you can have all these labels, and then you can train your model from it. The question is, like, how will you provide the labels for this robot? What is the right actions? I don't know. It's not that clear. What will be the right answer for this case? So we are going to take a different approach, where it's like reinforced learning. Trying, instead of trying to provide the right answer, like you know, in a classical setting, you will go to class, and they tell you what is the right answers. You, know, you study, this is the answer for this problem. We already know what is the right answer. In a reinforced learning, we assume we don't know what is the right answer. We need to figure it out ourselves. It's more like a kid. It's playing around. You know, putting these levels together, and eventually they're able to stack it up together and stand up. And that gives you like, some reward. It's like, oh, you feel proud of it, and then you keep doing it. Which are the actions you took? Not so relevant. So let's formalize a little more what reinforced learning is and how you can actually make this into more concrete examples. Let's take a simpler example, like this little game that you're trying to play. You, know, you want to bounce the ball around, move the paddle at the bottom, left or right. And then you want to hit all these bricks and you know, play this game, clear up, and win the game. No? So we're going to have this notion of an agent or program that's going to get some observation. In this case, a frame is going to look at the game, where is the ball, where are the bricks, where is the paddle, and take an action. Going to move to the left, or you're going to move to the right. And depending where you move, the ball will drop, or you actually start you know, keeping the ball bouncing back. And we're going to have this notion of reward, What is like when you do well, we want you to get positive reward, so you reinforce that behavior. And when you do poorly, you will get negative reward. So we can define you know, simple rules and simple things to basically encode this behavior as a reward function. Every time you hit a brick, you get 10 points. Which actions do you need to do to hit the brick? I don't tell you. That's what you need to learn. But if you do it, I'm going to give you 10 points. 
And if you hit clear all the bricks, I'm going to give you actually 100 points to encourage you to actually play this game very well. And every time the ball drops, you lose 50 points, which means probably not a good idea to do that. And if you let the ball drop three times, game is over, you need to start the game. So the good thing is about the reinforced learning, you can apply it to many different problems. And here are some examples that over the last year, people have been applying reinforced learning. And goes from recommender systems in YouTube, data set to cooling, real robots. You can apply to maths, chemistry, or cute little robot in the middle, and things as complex as they go, like DeepMind applied to AlphaGo and beat you know, the best player in the world by using reinforced learning. Now let me switch a little bit to TF agents and what it is. So the main idea of TF agents is like doing reinforced learning is not very easy, it requires a lot of tools and a lot of like things that you need to uh, built on your own. So build, we build this library that we use at Google and we open source so everybody, all of you can use it to make reinforced learning a lot easier to use. So we make it very robust, scalable. Uh, we, it's good for beginners. If you are new to RL, we have a lot of like notebooks, example, documentation that you can start and working on. And also for complex problems. You can apply it to real complex problems and use it for like, you know, realistic cases. For people who want to create their own algorithm, we also make it easy to add new algorithms. It's well tested and easy to configure. Um, furthermore, we build it on top of like TensorFlow 2.0 that you probably you heard over Google I.O. before. And we make it in such a way so it's developing and debugging is a lot easier. You can use TF eager mode and Keras and TF functions to make things a lot easier to build. Very modular, very extensible. Let me cover a little bit of the main pieces of the software. So then when we go through the examples, you have a better sense. On the left side, we have all the data collection. When we play this game, we are going to collect data. You know? We are going to play the game. We are going to collect data so we can learn from it. And on the right side, we are going to have a training pipeline. When we have the data, like a data set or login or games we play, we are going to train from it, improve our model, in this case, the neural net. I'm going to deploy, collect more data, and repeat. So now, let me hand it over to Eugene, who's going to go over the carpool example. Thanks, Sergio. Uh, yeah, so uh, the first example we're going to go over is uh, a problem called carpool. This is one of the classical control problems, where imagine that you have a pole in your hand, and it wants to fall over because of gravity, and you kind of have to move your hand left and right to keep it upright. And if it falls over, then uh, game over. If, it, uh, if you move off the screen by accident, then game over. So let's um, make that a little bit more concrete. In this environment, the observation is not uh, the images that you see here. Instead, it's a four vector containing angles and velocities of the pole and the, um, and the cart. The actions are the values 0 and 1, representing being able to take a left or a right. And the reward is the value uh, 1.0 every um, time step or frame that the pole is up and hasn't fallen over more than 15 degrees from vertical. And once, uh, once it has, uh, the episode ends. OK, so if you were to implement this problem or environment yourself, you would subclass the TF agents by environment class. And you would provide two properties. One is called the observation uh, spec. And that defines what the observations are. And you would implement the action spec property. And that describes what actions the environment allows. And there are two major methods. One is a reset, which resets the environment and brings the pole back to the center and vertical. And the set method, which accepts the action and updates any internal state and emits the observation and the reward for that time step. Now, uh, for this particular problem, you don't have to do that. We support OpenAI Gym, which is a very popular um, uh, framework for environments in Python. And you can simply load Carpool from that. That's the first line. And now you can perform some introspection. You can interrogate the environment, um, say, what is the observation spec? Uh, here you can see that it's a, a four vector of floating point values, again, describing the um, angle and velocities um, of the pole. And the action spec is a scalar integer, taking on values 0 and 1, representing left and right. So 
if you had your own policy that you had built, maybe a scripted policy, uh, you would uh, be able to interact with the environment by loading it, building your policy object, resetting the environment to get an initial state, and then iterating over and over again, uh, passing the observation or the state uh, to the policy, getting an action from that, uh, passing the action back to the environment, maybe calculating your um, um, return, which is the sum of the rewards over all steps. Now, the, the interesting part comes when you want to uh, make a trainable policy, and you want it to learn from its successes in the environment. To do that, we put a neural network in the loop. So the neural network takes in the observations uh, and emits, uh, in this case, and the algorithm that we're talking about is called policy gradients, uh, also known as reinforce. Uh, it's going to emit probabilities over the actions that, that can be taken. So in this case, it's going to emit a probability of taking a left or a probability of taking a right, and that's parameterized by um, the weights of the neural network called theta. And ultimately, um, the goal um, of this algorithm is going to be modifying the neural network over time to maximize what's called the expected return. And as I mentioned, the return is the sum of the rewards over the um, duration of the episode. And uh, you, can, uh, you can calculate it by just um, uh, this expectation. Um, it's difficult to calculate analytically. So we, what we're going to do is we're going to sample episodes by playing. We're going to get trajectories. And we're going to um, store those trajectories. And these are observation action pairs over the, over the episode. We're going to add them up. And that's our Monte Carlo estimate of the return. Okay? And we're going to make a couple of tricks that, to convert that expectation optimization problem into a sum that we can optimize using gradient descent. I'm going to skip over some of the math. But basically, what we use is something called the log trick to convert this uh, gradient problem into the gradient over the outputs of the neural network. That's that log pi theta right there. That's the output of the network. And we're going to multiply that by the Monte Carlo estimate of the returns. And we're going to average over um, the time steps within the episode and over many batches of episodes. Putting this into code, and by the way, we implement this for you, but just kind of a kind of pseudocode here. Uh, you get this experience when you're training. Uh, you ex extract its rewards, and you do a cumulative sum type operation to calculate the returns. Then you take the observations over all the time steps, and you calculate the logits, the log probabilities coming out of uh, the neural network. You uh, pass those to a distribution object. Uh, this is a tensile probability distribution object to get the, the distributions over the actions. And then you, you can calculate this, the, the full log probability of the actions that were taken. Um, in your trajectories, in your logs, and calculate this approximation of the, of the, of the expectation and take its gradient. OK, so uh, as an end user, you don't need to worry about that too much. Uh, what you uh, want to do is you load your environment, you wrap it in something called a TFPy environment, and this eases the interaction between the Python um, uh, problem setting and the environment and the neural network, which is um, being executed by the TensorFlow runtime. Now, uh, you can also you create your network, your neural network. And here, you can write your own. Basically, it's a sequence of Keras layers. Those of you who are familiar with Keras, that makes it very easy to describe your own architecture for the, uh, for the network. Uh, we provide a number of neural networks. Uh, this one uh, accepts a number of parameters to configure the architecture. So here. There are two fully connected layer, uh, layers with sizes 32 and 64. You pass this network and the specs associated with the environment to the agent class. And now you're ready to collect data and to train. So to collect data, you need a place to store it. And uh, Sergio will talk about this some more in the second example. But uh, basically, we use something called replay buffers and, uh, that are going to store these trajectories. And we provide a number of utilities that allow you to, that will collect the data for you, and they're called drivers. So the, this driver takes the environment, takes the policy uh, exposed by the agent class, and a number of callbacks. 
And what it's going to do is it's going to iterate, collecting data, um, interacting with the environment, sending it actions, collecting observations, sending those to the policy, um, does that for you. And each time it does that, for every time step, it stores that in a replay buffer. So to train, uh, you uh, iterate, calling driver run, which uh, uh, populates the replay buffer. Then you pull out all of the trajectories from the replay buffer with gather all. You pass those to agent.train, which updates the underlying neural networks. And uh, because policy gradients is an, something called an on-policy algorithm, um, all that hard-earned collected data that you've done, you have to throw it away um, and collect more. Okay? So uh, that said, Carpo is a fairly straightforward classical problem, as I mentioned. And policy gradients is a fairly standard, uh, somewhat simple algorithm. And after about 400 iterations of playing the game, um, you can see that uh, whereas you started with a random policy that can't keep the pull up at all, after 400 iterations of playing the game, you basically have a perfect policy. And um, if you were to look at your tensor board while you're training, you'd see a plot like this, which shows that as the number of episodes that are being collected increases, the total return, which is the sum of the rewards over the episode, um, goes up um, pretty consistently. And at around 400, 500 episodes, um, we have a perfect algorithm that runs for 200 steps, at which point the episode says, all right, you're good, you win, um, and, uh, um, and then you're done. OK, so I'm going to hand it back over to Sergio to talk about Atari and DeepQ learning. Thank you, Jim. So now we are going to back to this example that I talked at the beginning about how to play this game. And uh, now we are going to go into more details how it actually works and how this deep Q learning works to help us in this case. Uh, so let's go back to our setting. No? We have our environment where we are going to be playing. We're going to get some observations, in this case, frames. The A in role is to produce different actions, like go left the paddle or go right, and get some rewards in the process, and then improve over time by basically getting, incorporating those rewards into the uh, model. Let's take a little step and say, what if like, while I'm playing Breakout, I have seen how far what I've been doing. You know, the ball is going somewhere. I'm moving in the center direction. And then what should I do now? Should I go to the right, or should I go to the left? If I knew what is going to happen, it would be very easy. You know? If I knew, it's like, oh, the ball is going to go this way, the thing is going to be that, that would be very easy. But that one we don't easily know. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. Instead, what we're going to do, we are going to try to estimate if I move to the right, maybe the ball will drop. It's more likely that the ball drop because I'm moving in the opposite direction than the ball is going. And if I move to the left, on the contrary, I'm going to hit the ball. I'm going to you know, hit some bricks. I'm getting closer to clear all the bricks. So the idea is like I want to learn a model that can estimate that. If this action is going to make me go better into the future, or is going to make it go worse. And that's something what we call like the spectral return. So is this notion that Eugene was talking before, that before we were just computing, just summing all the rewards? And here we're going to say, I want to estimate this action, how much reward it's going to give me in the future. And then I choose the thing that is like, according to my estimate, is the best action. So this is, you know, we can formulate this with using math. It's basically like an expectation over like the sum of the rewards into the future. And that's when I call this Q function or like critic. And it's also a critic because it's going to basically tell us, given some state and possible actions, which action is actually better. It's going to criticize in some way, like, if you take this action, my expectation of the return is very high. And you take a different action, my expectation is low. And then what we're going to do, we're going to learn these Q functions. Because we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. But by playing, we can learn what is the expected return by comparing our expectation with the actual returns. So we are going to use you know, a Q function, uh, in this case, a neural net, to learn this model. And once we have a learned model, then we can just take the best action according to our model and play the game. So conceptually, this looks similar to what we saw before. We are going to have another neural net. And in this case, the output is going to be the Q values, this expectation of our future returns. You know? And the idea is like we are going to get an observation, in this case, the frames. We're going to maybe have some history about it. And then we're going to produce some Q value, which is like our current expectation if I move to the left, 
and my current expectation if I move to the right. And then I'm going to compare my expectation, what we actually happen. And if basically my expectation is too high, I'm going to lower down. And if my expectation is too low, I'm going to increase it. So that way, we're going to change these networks, the weight of this network to basically improve over time by playing this game. Uh, if we go back to the code, like how you do this into code, is basically we're going to load the, this environment, in this case, like from the suite Atari, which is also available from OpenAI Engine. I'm going to say, OK, load the breakout game, and now we are ready to play. We're going to have some observations, but define what kind of observations we have in this case, where it's frames of like 84 by 84 pixels. And we also have multiple actions we can take. In this game, we can only go left and right, but there are other games in this suite that can have different actions, maybe jumping, firing, doing other things that, that different games have. So now we want to do that notion of what we said before. We're going to define this Q network. Remember, it's a neural net where it's going to represent these Q values and going to have some parameters that define how many layers, how many things we want to have, and all those things. And then we're going to have this DQ engine that's going to take the network and an optimizer, which is going to basically be able to improve this network over time, given some experience. So this experience, we are going to assume that we have collected some data, we have played the game, and maybe not very well at the beginning, because we are doing random actions, for example. So we are not playing very well, but we can get some experience, and then we can improve over time, basically. We try to improve our estimates. Every time we improve, we play a little better, and then we collect more data. And then we, the idea is that this agent is going to have a train method that's going to go through this experience, and it's going to improve over time. In general, for cases like games or environments that are too slow, we don't want to play one game at a time. You know? This is a computer that can play multiple games in parallel. So we have this notion of like parallel environments. You can play multiple copies of the same game at the same time, so we can make learning a lot faster. And in this case, we are playing like four games in parallel. We are going to have our policy that we're going to just define. And in parallel, we can just play four games at the same time. So the agent, in this case, will try to play four games at the same time. And that way, we'll get a lot of more experience so we can learn a lot faster. So as we mentioned before, where we are collecting all this data by playing this game, we just, in this case, we don't want to throw away the data. We can use it for learning. So we're going to have this replay buffer where it's going to keep all the data we are collecting, like different games will go in different positions, so we don't mix the games. But we're going to just store all the data in some replay buffer. And that, into the code, is simple. We have this environment. We create the replay buffer we have already defined. And then basically using the driver, and the more important like this, add to the replay buffer. Every time you play, take an action in this game, add it to the replay buffer. So later, the agent can train all that experience. And because DQN is an off-policy method, what is different than the previous method was on-policy, in this case, we can actually use all data. We can keep the data around and keep training on all data, too. We don't need it to throw it away. And that's very important because it makes it more efficient. What we're going to do when we have collect data in this replay buffer, we're going to do sample. We're going to sample different set of games, different portions of the game. I'm going to say, OK, let's try to replay the game and maybe take a different action this time. What action would you take if you were in the same situation? Maybe we, you move to the left and the ball drop. So maybe now you want to move to the right. So that's the way the model is going to be learning, by basically sample games that you played before and now improve your key function, which is going to change the way you behave. So now let's try to put these things back together. Uh, let's go slowly, because there's a lot of pieces. So it's like we have our Q network. We're going to use to define the DQN agent, in this case. We are going to have the replay buffer, where we're going to put all the data where we are collecting what we play. We have this driver, which basically drive the agent in the game. So it's going to basically drive in the agent, make him play, and add it to the replay buffer. And then we're going to, once we have enough data, we can basically iterate through that data. You know, we can iterate, get batches of experience, different samples, and that's what we're going to do for train the agent. So we are going to alternate, you know, collect more data and train the agent. So every time we collect, we train the agent, the agent gets a little better, and we want to collect more data, and we alternate. At the end, what we want to do is evaluate this agent. So we have a method that says, OK, I want to compute some metrics. For example, like how long are you playing the game? How many points are you getting? All those things that we want to compute metrics. 
And we basically have this method that says, OK, about take all these metrics in this environment, take the agent policy, and evaluate it for multiple games, multiple episodes, and multiple things. How this actually looks like is something like that. For example, in the breakout game, the curves look like that. You know, at the beginning, we don't score any points. You know, we don't know how to move the paddle. The ball just keeps dropping, and we just lose the game over and over. Eventually, we figure out that by moving the paddle in certain directions, the ball bounces back and starts hitting the bricks. And about like four or five million frames, the model actually learn how to actually play this game. And you can see around four or five million frames, basically, the model you know, gets very good scores, around 100 points, is breaking all these things, all these points, and you know, clearing all the bricks. We also put graphs of different games, like Pong, where it's basically two different paddles trying to bounce the ball between them, or Enduro, Cuber. There's an another like 50 or 60 games in this suite. And you can basically just change one line of code and play a different game. I'm not going to go to those details, but just to make clear that it's simple to play different games. Now, let me hand it over back to Jin, who's going to talk a little more into the miniature. Thanks, Rizia. Yeah. OK, so our third and final example, uh, our third and final example is uh, uh, the um, problem of the Minotaur robot. And kind of goes back to one of the first slides that Sergio uh, showed at the beginning of the talk, learning to walk. So there is a real robot. It's called the Minotaur. And here it's kind of failing hard. Uh, we're going to see if we can fix that. Uh, the algorithm we're going to use is called soft actor critic. OK. So, uh, again, uh, on the bottom, some, some images of the robot. Um, and you can see it looks a little fragile. We want to uh, train it. Uh, and we want to avoid breaking it um, in the beginning when our policy can't really s stay up. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, model it in a physics simulator called PyBullet. And that's what you see at the top. And then once we've trained it, uh, we are, we're confident about the policy uh, on that version, we're going to transfer it back into the robot and do some final fine tuning. And here we're going to focus on the uh, training and simulation. OK, so I won't go into the mathematical details of Soft Actor Critic, uh, but here are some fundamental aspects of, of that algorithm. One is that it can handle both discrete and continuous action spaces. Uh, here we're going to be controlling some motors and actuators, so it's a purely continuous action space. It's data efficient, meaning that uh, all this hard uh, earned data um, that you run in simulation or you got from the robot, you don't have to throw it away while you're training. You can keep, uh, keep it around for retraining. Also, the training is stable. Compared to some other algorithms, this one is less likely to diverge during training. And finally, one of the fundamental aspects is that it's soft actor critic. It combines an actor neural network and a critic neural network to accelerate training and to keep it stable. Okay. So uh, again, so uh, Minotaur, you can uh, basically uh, do a pip install of PyBullet, and you'll get Minotaur for free. Uh, you can load it using the PyBullet suite with TF agents. And if you were to look at this environment, you'd see that there are about 28 sensors on the robot uh, that return floating point values, um, different aspects of the configuration where you are, um, forces, velocities, things like that. And the action, there are eight actuators on the robot. It can apply a force, positive or negative, um, minus one to one for each of those eight actuators. Now, uh, here's kind of bringing together the whole setup. Uh, you can load uh, four of these simulations, have them running in parallel, and try to maximize the number of cores that you're using when you're collecting data. And to do that, we provide the parallel Pi environment, which Sergio spoke about, wrap it in a TF Pi environment. And now we get down to the business of setting up the neural network architecture uh, for the problem. First, we create the actor network. And so what the actor network is going to do is it's going to take the, these uh, sensor observations, this 28 vector, and it's going to emit samples um, of actuator values. And those samples are random draws from, in this case, uh, Gaussian or normal distribution. So as a result, the uh, actor network, this actor distribution network, takes something called a projection network. And we provide a number of standard projection networks. This one um, emits uh, sam um, samples from a Gaussian distribution. 
And the neural network um, that feeds into it is going to be setting up the uh, hyperparameters of that, of that distribution. Now, the critic network, uh, which is in the top right, is going to take a combination of the current sensor observations and the uh, sample, the action sample that the actor network emitted. And it's going to estimate the expected return, um, how much longer, given this action, is um, my, my robot going to stay up? How well is it going to gallop? Okay? And that it's going to be trained from the trajectories, from the rewards that you're collecting. And that, in turn, is going to help train the actor. Okay? So uh, you pass these networks and these specs to the soft actor critic agent. And you can um, look at its policy, its collection policy. And that's the thing that you're going to pass to the driver um, to start collecting data and interacting with the environment. So I won't go into the details of actually doing that, because it's literally identical to the deep Q-learning example uh, before. You need the replay buffer, um, and you use the driver, um, and you go through the, the, same, the same motion. What I am going to show is uh, what you should expect to see in the uh, tensor board uh, while you're training uh, the simulation. On the top, you see um, the average episode length, the average return, uh, as a function of the number of environment steps that you've taken, the number of time steps. On the bottom, you see the same thing, but it's a, uh, on the x-axis, you see the number of episodes that, you, that you've gone through. And what you can see is that after a, uh, about 13,000, 14,000 simulated episodes, we're starting to really learn how to walk and gallop. The episode lengths get longer because it takes longer to fall down, and the average return also goes up because it's also a function of how long we stay up and how well we can, we can gallop. So uh, again, uh, if you, this is the, the Pi Bullet simulation, a rendering of uh, the Minotaur. At the very beginning, when the policy just emits random values, uh, the neural network emits random values, it's randomly initialized, uh, and it can barely stay up. It, it basically falls over. About halfway through training, it's starting to be able to get up. Um, maybe make a few steps, falls over. If you apply some external forces, it'll just fall over. By about 16,000 um, iterations of this, uh, it's a pretty robust um, policy. And it can stay up, it can gallop. If there's an external force pushing it over, it'll be able to get back up and keep going. And once you uh, have, have that trained policy, you can transfer it, export it as a saved model, put it on the actual robot, and then start the fine-tuning process. Once you've fine-tuned it, uh, you have a pretty neat, pretty neat um, robot. I in my head, when I look at this video, I think of like the Chariots of Fire um, a theme song. I don't know if you've ever seen it, uh, but it's pretty cool. So uh, now I'm going to return it back to Sergio to um, provide some final words. Thank you, Ian. Mm -hmm. So pretty cool, no? You can get from the beginning how to learn to walk and actually make this in simulation, but then we can transfer to a real robot, no? And make it walk into a real robot. So that's part of the goal of TF Agents. We want to make RL very easy. You can download the code. You can scan over there, go to the GitHub, start playing with it. We have already you know, a lot of different environments, more than we talked today. There's a many more. So we just covered three examples, but you can go there, check many. There's many other environments available. Uh, we are hoping that Unity ML agents come soon, so you can also interact with M uh, Unity renders. Uh, maybe there's some of you who are actually interested to contribute in your own environments, your own problems. And we are also very happy to take you know, pull requests and contributions to our thing. For those of you who say, OK, those games are really good, the game looks nice, but I have my own problem, what do I do? So let's go back to the beginning when we talk about you, you can't define your environment. You can't define your own task. This is the main piece that you need to follow. This is the API you need to follow to bring your task or your problem to TF agents. You define the specifications of your observations, like what things can I see? Can I see images? Can I see numbers? What those means? What actions available do I have? Do I have two actions, three actions, 10 different actions? What are the possibilities I have? And then the reset method, because as we say, while we're learning, we need to keep trying. So we need to reset and start again. And then the step function, where it's like, if I give you an action, 
what will happen? How the environment, how the task is going to evolve? Where the state is going to change? And you need to tell me the reward. Am I doing well in going in the right direction, or am I going in the wrong direction so I can learn from it? So this is the main piece of code that you will need to implement to solve your own problem. Additionally, we only talk about three algorithms, but we have many more in the code base. As you can see here, there are many more coming. So there's a lot of variety. Different algorithms have different strengths that you, when you apply to different problems. So you can just try different combinations and see which one actually works for your problem. And also, there's also, we are taking contributions for other people who say, oh, I have this algorithm. I want to implement this one. I have this new idea. And maybe you can solve better problems with your algorithm. And furthermore, it's like we also apply this not only to this game, but we apply at Google, for example, in you know, robotics. In this really complex problem that we have multiple robots trying to learn how to grasp objects and move into a different places. So in this case, we have all these robots just trying to grasp and fail at the beginning. And eventually, they learn, like, oh, how do, where is the object? How do I move the hand? How do I do the, close the gripper in the proper place? And then how do I grasp it? And this is a very complex task that you can solve with reinforced learning. Furthermore, you can also solve many other problems. For example, recommender systems, like YouTube recommendations, Google Play, navigation, news. Those are many of the problems that you can basically say, I want to optimize for my objective, my long-term value. Not only like the short term, but also like the long-term value. And RL is really good for that. When you want to optimize for the long-term value, not only the short term. Finally, we have put a lot of effort to make this call available and make it usable for a lot of people. But at Google, we also define these AI principles. So when we develop all this code, we make it available, we follow these principles. We want to make it sure that this is used for like, so things that benefit the society, that doesn't reinforce you know, unfair bias, that doesn't discriminate, you know, that is built for you know, tests for safety, Privacy is embedded in the beginning. It's accountable. You know, we keep very high standards. And we also want to make sure that everybody who uses this code also embrace those principles and trying to you know, make it better. And there's many applications we won't pursue. You know, we don't want to be this used for like, harming and all these damaged things that you know, could happen. Finally, I want to thank you know, the whole team. You know, it's not just Eugene and me that we made this happen. There's a lot of people behind. There's the TF agents team over here. There's a lot of contributors that have contributed to the code. And you know, we are very proud of all the work they have done to make this happen, to make this possible to be you know, open source and available for everyone. So as we said before, we want all of you to join us in GitHub. You know, go to the web page, download it, start playing with it. A really good place is go to the call apps and the notebooks and say, OK, I want to try the Reinforce example. I want to try the DQN or the Software or Critic. We have notebooks. You can play. You, Google Cloud will run for you all these examples. And also, you have issues or pull requests with Welcome. So we want you to be part of the community, you know, contribute to make this a lot better. So, and furthermore, we are also looking for new applications, what all of you can do with these new tools. There's a lot of new problems you can apply this, and we are looking forward to it. So thank you very much, and hope to you know, see you around.